I'm so pleased to see such a wonderful turnout. Um, we have several of the artists here tonight who I will be introducing shortly. Um, but first, I'd like to turn it over to our executive director, Lynn Castle. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I know we have a lot of people here from out of town, and thanks for making the trip. We hope that you will sign in our sign-in book, uh, because we get money for out-of-town visitors. So, hotel, hotel tax. So, even if you don't join the museum tonight, which we hope you will consider doing, you are still making a contribution just by signing the guest book. Um, and an exhibition like this would not be possible without the generosity of our underwriters, and I would like to acknowledge them now. Texas Commission on the Arts, National Endowment for the Arts, Wesley W. Washburn, MD, and Lulu Smith, MD, Endowment Fund, the C. Homer and Edith Fuller Chambers Charitable Foundation, the City of Beaumont, and of course members of the Art Museum of Southeast Texas, and additional funding was provided by the Honorable Marsha and W. Seth Crone, Jr., and I don't think they could make it tonight. To find out more about National Endowment for the Arts grants that impact individuals and communities, visit www.arts.gov. <laughs> and that's the end of the infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. I'm going to add to that thank you list as well. Um, I would also like to thank Lynn for um, assisting in writing all the grants and her support always of the exhibitions we have here at the Art Museum. I'd like to thank the staff. There are a few of you here, a few of you in the lobby that I know can hear me. Um, exhibitions like this don't come together without the assistance of many people. And we have a wonderfully dedicated, supportive staff here at the Art Museum, and I'm always so grateful for their assistance with our exhibitions in whatever capacity it is that they help us with. I would also like to thank um, the artists and the galleries. Um, a shout out to Anya Tish, Chris Worley, Betty Moody, and Sarah Foltz. Thank you all so much for representing these wonderful artists. Um, they are so very talented, and it makes a curator's job a lot easier when you have someone like a wonderful gallery that you can connect with. Unfortunately, all of our artists tonight couldn't join us. There are 11 of them total, if you haven't counted their names on the title wall. Um, but we have several of them here tonight, and I would like to introduce each of them. Um, again, this is sort of an informal introduction. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about their bios, and then you all are welcome to ask them questions. This is an opportunity for you to get to know them, and they get to know you. And so um, you can hear their wonderful bios. Many of these women are very talented, and um, you can ask them about their works here in the exhibition. Another way you can support these artists beyond coming to our opening receptions is considering purchasing their work. There is a price list available at the front desk if you're interested, or you can ask them about commissions. That's also a wonderful way as well. And um, yes, so tonight with us, we have Adela Andia, who did the incredible light installation we're standing in. Adela. Again, everyone has such incredible CVs. I had to cut them down a little bit. And <laughs> I have to bring a list with me. <laughs> so, Romanian born artist Adela Andia works and lives in Conroe, Texas. She is known for her innovative light installations that create an all encompassing visual and temporal experience. She constructs futuristic forms and environments with her medium, combining technical materials such as magnifying lenses, LED lights, flex neon, and power sources with organic motifs. So I highly encourage you to look very closely. There's a lot of different materials in this um, installation. Her purpose is to manifest with the use of non-traditional materials the uncanny relationship man has with technology, a relationship that involves knowledge of the familiar and swift adaptation to ever-changing systems. Her inspirations are almost always derived from science, from the bioluminescence of underwater sea life to the melting icebergs that plague the planet, to cosmological and interstellar events. She constructs nature and science in a technological vernacular, and this piece is site-specific for our institution, 
So if you are interested in seeing other pieces, um, you actually can travel to Germany. She just got back from there <laughs> for a really cool installation. Um, but if you have any questions for Adela, um, we are welcome to take them now, or you can ask her in person if you'd like. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Okay, I'll break it down. Yes, thank you, Charlotte. Is this a hard road? Does this, did you think, to me that has something that's like a heart with valves and... Well, I, I do work with a lot of um, organic systems, and I look inside the bodies, and uh, I create them to look happy through technology and colorful materials, but they're not all necessarily very, very happy. Uh, we did speak a little bit earlier, so I was born in Romania, Eastern Europe, uh, and uh, I'm a survivor of Chernobyl, and that was from the beginning a little bit of that in, into my work, all these organic forms inside the body, being scared of dying of those <laughs> mutations. And, uh, but they do become happy environments, like I said, two layers of color and new technology, and I have that optimism about the future that we'll do better if the technology gets better. We don't need to go backwards. <laughs> and I don't believe in that. So, so that, that is, that is uh, yeah, that is true to that. It's it's fantastic. fantastic. How did you end up in Conroe, Texas? <laughs> 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 I finally feel like I'm out of Beaumont. <laughs> <laughs> well, I lived in California for six years, and um, uh, one day me and my husband decided that uh, I need more space because <laughs> I want to work big, and I, I, I like to store a lot of materials. So we visited Houston. Uh, it was a beautiful March day. <laughs> and there's this huge fall going on and we both fell in love with it. I was like, I like this. <laughs> I don't know what it is about, but that was 18 years ago. <laughs> so we moved there, we purchased our first house. Right now we are remodeling our second one and they saw it. <laughs> uh, it's always a work in progress, but I do love the space. I do love uh, the friendliness of the people here and I don't want to move anywhere else. <laughs> and I travel a lot. I did spend a lot of time in Europe uh, because of the permanent collection uh, for the Museum of Light Art in Una. And also I have two galleries right now in Germany. But this is my home. <laughs> I'm guessing you dream in color. <laughs> I do have very, very vivid dreams. I, I don't know why. I don't wake up like in like any time to wake up basically because everything I'm thinking before I go to sleep comes in a dream and I solve problems that way and I, I think most of my ideas come in, the, in between stages, between dream and being awake. And yes, I do have colorful dreams. I also have taste in my dreams. I was eating these desserts like two nights ago and I like I tasted everyone. How is it possible to try them all? <laughs> When you woke up, were you ready for dessert? Yes. <laughs> it was interesting. It was just color, but taste. <laughs> what about you? Two more questions. Yes, ma'am, right here. Okay. Uh, have you ever worked with this medium, or this evolves from, from anything else? Uh, it's been a process. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I want to be a painter. I think I'm still a painter, but <laughs> um, I started painting at uh, a very early age. And um, I then when I, we moved to Houston, I joined the painting program at the University of Houston. I finished that, first in my class, but <laughs> that's not important. But during that process, I realized that um, the way we perceive color, it comes from light. So it's the light bouncing back. So I went to the origin of what, what is the source of how we see the color in the brightest way. So that's one aspect. The other aspect that came with that 
um, was the new technologies because I, I knew already about the light move from the pioneers of light arts in the 1960s. The main purpose of, for me, for my education, and even as a professor right now, is not to repeat the past. So I wanted to bring something new to the light movement, and that was the new technology. Through that, we can express different ideas, different uh, materials, uh, the history of the moment. And uh, it started with, um, and I have to bring uh, again a story of my husband's computer, he's a software engineer. I came home crying from a critique in art school. <laughs> <laughs> I think it all of us, right? And then I look at his computer and I was like, I need this, I'm going to change what I'm doing. I want this to replace what I've been doing. I already started to make objects, I already started to transform from painting to reliefs to uh, more objects into space, but they were painted, so they were not light sculptures first, so that was the transition. And then the moment I start to realize that the material itself is very important, that's when uh, I completely embrace it. And I moved away from the traditional form, working with clay and plaster, wood. I mean, I'm still welding, but <laughs> things like that. Uh, so I, I transform and, and taking, embracing the, what it, the material, what it is, the medium is. The message, basically, right? And uh, we are in a consumer society, so for me, looking around and just finding new things and moving them out of context, it's very important to bring awareness to different technologies. It's been, I don't know how many years, like more than a decade. <laughs> so, do you have a, a plan when you start these? Are there a starting point? Do they evolve as you go? Or is there a specific plan? Uh, but thank you for the question. Everybody expects me to do that. Uh, especially with proposals and stay organized. <laughs> <laughs> it's the other way around. I have the ideas, they fly around and doing stuff. The whole house, it's a mess. The whole house is <laughs> uh -huh. And then somebody says, can you make a sketch for some And I was like, sure, but I have to basically think what I already know, how it's going to look in a different medium. So making a drawing or a 3ds max presentation of something I know how already the material works like it, it, it's the source of it it's I mean I can imagine many things but if it's not doing what it wants to do it's not gonna be a great um, sculpture or installation so yes I I don't have lesson plans the drawings and the things come afterwards for me it's a matter of <laughs> um, documenting, archiving, uh, rather than uh, brainstorming. Well, thank you so much. Okay. The next artist who's joining us tonight is Claire Ankenman. She's here. Um, Claire was born in Victoria, Texas, and currently lives and works in Houston, Texas. She studied at the Glassell School of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston from 1985 to 1991. Her work has been included in a solo exhibition at the Galveston Art Center, as well as group exhibitions at Lawndale Art Center, the Blacker Art Museum, Diverse Works, Art League Houston, Williams Tower Gallery, and Women in Their Works, as well as other venues. Her work is included in the collections of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, AT&T Stadium, Dallas Cowboys Art Collection, Arlington, U.S. Trust, Dallas, and many other private collections. Please welcome Claire Ankenman. So we're not actually standing in a space for you to see Claire's work. <laughs> I hope you had a chance to already walk through the galleries, but Claire's piece is actually on the opposite side of this wall. It's that incredible plexiglass sculpture that is hanging on the wall um, right behind us. And um, I guess, Claire, I will start with a question. Okay. What brought you to working in plexiglass? Well, you know, it's like everything just sort of evolves with me. I feel like a mad scientist, you know, sort of, because I love materials. I've always worked with uh, mixed media. And so <clears throat> I have worked with sewing on paper, 
I've used my mammograms. I've used every possible material you can think of because I love material, love mixed media. So I was doing a big uh, work with um, sort of sculpture with frosted mylar with a, a sculpture in between with maybe color kind of peeking through. And so I kind of, then I was doing some box sculptures where everything was cut out so you could kind of look in the depth and see things. So as I told Betty, I just sort of jumped out of the box. And that's exactly what happened there. And I think the, I got really interested in, in industrial materials and taking them, like stainless steel and taking the, the, the plastic and kind of making it into something that has some sort of transcendence somewhere. Um, and that particular piece is sort of a very sleek piece. It's all really about color and light. Um, but I think to get to your question, it just was, it just evolved into my love of material. And so now I'm just kind of stuck there. Just like this, this color. I think this color just hit right before uh, the coronavirus. And I think everyone was just thirsty for color. And so that was sort of the shift for me uh, to bringing it out of the box from under the muted uh, palette I was using to something that's just bam right there. So that's that's the answer. <laughs> Thank you. You want to have a question for Clay? I did. The cutting of you know the cutting of the it looks very technical. Well, it right. is, and I basically it's kind of hard to explain. Um, I design every piece exactly the how it's going to be and the cuttings and all of that so i have drawings and i have mock-ups because i have some old you know frames and then i have companies because they someone has to make the stainless steel rod someone has to make the 3d printed stainless steel top and bottom connectors someone has to i have to order the plexi then i have to have someone who cuts it exactly like i want it and then it's like it's a lot and I always used to work just by myself I used to make everything by hand so this is kind of a hard thing in a way you know turning over something but to get the, the refinement and whatever I'm not cutting the plexi myself I don't have I'm not I'm in a tiny apartment <laughs> I don't have the all the things that you have to do and to me the pieces have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm not so certain that if I had my own cutter, I'd probably be going like this. You know, I'm not that young anymore, so probably like this. So that wouldn't be perfect. So to your question, um, I make all the plans, color, design, the whole thing, the shape, the dimensions, and give it all to this company, and they put it together for me. Mm -hmm. They're under the design. Yes. <laughs> question for you. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a chance to see these beautiful sketches she's talking about um, while I was visiting Betty Moody and um, I was wondering how often do those sketches manifest into a final sculpture? Well that's interesting because during the coronavirus uh, it was really great because I didn't have to stay home because my apartment my car parks right behind the back door. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have to stay home with my wonderful husband. <laughs> and so I would get in the car and drive up, you know, to the back door, walk right in, don't see anybody. So that's when I started drawing all those that you saw. So I did a different drawing every day. Okay. And basically, I wouldn't say that they have advanced into a sculpture, but that's not to say that it won't be the future. Um, but as you saw the drawings, they're extremely complicated. You know, I almost wanted to have them in the show, but they were like, we think they're just sketches, they're not final pieces. Well, actually, they are, and you're welcome to have them. Oh, well, next time. <laughs> they are, they are. They're, they're, but that was some meditation through the whole thing. And so. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, if y'all don't have a chance to see them, there's a few on the Movie Gallery website. I absolutely recommend y'all look them up. They're very beautiful. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you. Okay. The next 
artist I'd like to introduce is Emma Balder, who is here off to my right. <laughs> Emma currently lives and works in Houston, Texas. Her work softens the boundaries between paintings and textiles. So um, if you are in the sort of French gallery, if you turn off to your left, you'll see those beautiful draw framed drawings. Those are Emma's, two of Emma's pieces. And then her, her third piece is actually behind um, my back right hand shoulder. It's the uh, textile sculptural piece on the wall. Um, so you have a sense of uh, her work and what we're talking about. In her 3D works, uh, Emma makes paintings behave like fabric, painting abstractly on canvas and then tearing the canvas apart before sewing the pieces back together to create her dynamic sculptures. She refers to these sculptural paintings as pinglets, which I love, <laughs> which are created from a mother painting. They then become indi individual beings comprised of connected parts. Boulder also incorporates textile waste into her pieces using cast off materials to stuff her sculptures or applying thread in a paint like manner. So if you look really closely at those drawings, which I encourage you to look very closely at all the artwork in this exhibition, um, you'll see that there are very small textile threads incorporated into the paint and the graphite as well. These drawings resemble creatures or blasts of living energy. Through her work, Balder is interested in revealing beauty and refuse and mutual understanding between mediums. Intrigued by correlations between the natural world and humanity, Balder uses her dual processes to express the value of nature's teachings, change, interconnection, and regeneration. Emma holds a BFA in painting from the Savannah College of Art and Design. She has exhibited in venues such as Torpedo Factory Art Center, Londell Art Center, Trestle Gallery, Fultz Fine Art, the Lincoln Center, Gustine Gust Gallery, among others. In 2015, she was awarded a one-year Staff Artist Residency Fellowship at the Vermont Studio Center. It was named a finalist of the Peripheral Vision Foundation Prize in 2016. In 2022, she was a recipient of the Houston Arts Alliance Support for Artists and Creative Individuals Grant, funded by the City of Houston. And she has collaborated with companies such as Meow Wolf, Sweet Green, and PepsiCo's Life Water. Please give it up for Emma Balder. Do you want to tell us a bit more about what brought you to working with textiles? What brought me to working with textiles? Um, sure. So I've always really been interested in textiles. Um, as a kid, I was very interested in fashion um, and would actually cut up my own clothes and um, try to make new things out of them. Um, but um, I basically fell in love with painting um, as a teenager and um, kind of explored that medium um, at SCAD um, in college. And then when I was in Vermont at this residency fellowship, um, I started cutting up my paintings and rearranging the pieces and sewing them together and kind of revisiting textiles. Um, and I really, I had kind of come back to textiles because I had started noticing all these artists that were around me that were coming in to do residencies um, at this program um, from all over the world. And they would, uh, there was a lot of waste that they were creating. And so it really bothered me and I saw beauty in it and wanted to use it in my work. And so um, there was a lot of paper, um, there was, and there was a lot of textile waste. So I started bringing back, uh, bringing those textiles back into my, my life and my work, and I kind of found my way back to, to using fabric. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? You have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Emma had a studio visit, so. Charlotte, yes, always coming in with a question. Did you start a question first? Do you use the fabric in its natural state? Do you dye it ever with vegetable dyes? Do you use wax? Do you do things like that? 
Yeah, so I, I use the fab, I, I don't dye fabric, um, although it's something that intrigues me. Um, but I'm, you know, when I'm, I'm using textiles from you know different makers and artists and designers who will, who will just give me their their scraps, um, or you know people will just donate fabrics to me. Um, and so I'm using the color that's there within the textiles um, with the the what I call fiber paintings um, with the wind drawings in the corner there. Um, I am. Uh, this is a question that comes up a lot is am I am I dyeing the, the fibers or am I painting the fibers and the answer is no the fibers um, are are a specific color when I'm painting with them uh, because I'm using a, a, a clear medium to basically adhere the fibers onto the paper and, and treating the fibers like like paint um, but uh, and then I basically go in with acrylic and um, kind of add coloring to the outskirts of the fibers um, to kind of accentuate the colors that's art, that are already there within the fibers. So I bet your house kind of looks like hers. Stuff everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think my husband can attest to that. <laughs> How do you understand the process of abstraction? Right, because you're clearly doing abstraction, and I'm curious to me, what does it feel like? Why abstraction? Why not just make a cat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cats question. are great and all. Um, <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, and I, it's interesting that you bring that up, because I think, especially within my the fiber painting, I think that there, um, there's this element of, of pareidolia, and I talk about this a lot in my work, so um, this pareidolia is um, kind of like a Rorschach test, so um, seeing something recognizable within the abstract. And sometimes, to me, that's really interesting because you know we each find our own meaning within abstraction, and we each um, you know can see something different. And, that to me is more powerful than you know just simply giving someone an image um, and giving someone um, something that's recognizable that they you know can interpret as this or that. Whereas you know I think abstraction just leaves it so open and um, yeah. I think that it's great that you give the uh, the patron an opportunity to make their own meaning of it, like that experience on themselves. Um, you know, some people get it from the title, but from the image itself, like to have that opportunity to see what I want to see instead of the artist just give you a cat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, please give it up for Emma. Yeah. <laughs> that works well. Um, the next artist I would like to introduce is Liz Gates. Liz is here next to me. Liz is a Houston-based painter, sculptor, and mixed media artist who works whose works are concerned with questions of gender, labor, self-manifestation, and feminist mother identity. So uh, to have a sense of which works we're speaking about, the, the first one when you walk in behind you all, made out of the cloth diapers, co-emergence is Liz's piece. Um, we also have a fantastic piece made out of window blinds and um, mixed textiles and fabrics and uh, paper and paraphernalia. And then um, we also have three embossed arches paper prints behind us in the back gallery as well. Um, Gates works are in dialogue with art historical representations of mother and child and are inspired by the many manifestations and dualities of motherhood. With her practice, Gates deconstructs and reimagines traditional objects and symbols associated with motherhood, such as diapers and baby shoes, in order to establish external representations of the internal processes that are integral and generate new representational space and modes of understanding. 
Liz received her MFA from the University of Houston in 2022. Her work has previously been shown at the Blacker Art Museum, Londell Center for the Arts, Hardy and Nancy Studios, sorry, Hardy and Nance Studios, Spendora Gardens, Elgin Street Studios, and Third Space Gallery. Her work was featured in Go Forth from Houston, Women in the Arts Take Action, an exhibition held by the University of Houston that comm commemorated the 1977 National Women's Conference. Please give it up for Liz Gates. abstraction because it was necessary to subvert some of the minefields of nostalgia and sentimentality that um, come with the with that conversation and um, yeah also like removing color like removing all of the things that could have tripped me up in having this very serious dialogue um, reaching for color now loving the color back to color um, but but those I gave myself over to the materiality because I felt like um, it, uh, it was a necessary direction to go and it was also um, interesting for me to flip the script on the finished work by showing the seams and privileging the choices that the maker made. I really wanted to um, have the mother or the maker, the mother maker both, um, be the object of the work instead of the subject of the work. I did not want, I wanted to like um, get rid of all of the temptation to have her looked at instead of heard. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Diverse. Yes. Maybe basic. <clears throat> did you make your work during your child rearing or is it after? It's after, so I'm sort of in a spin cycle, empty nester, self-evaluation. I can do all that. Uh -huh. you have a kid yeah, like, yeah. So I'm reevaluating all of that and looking at motherhood from this point of view has been an interesting thing to do. And um, I was a single mother, and, and it was just the kids and I, so we were the three musketeers. And I've, it's been a cool thing to do with my kids in a way, in conversation with my kids. I'm very close to my kids. So the underbelly, sort of, like the tension, the need, the, in, in my artist statement it talks about the, the need for responsibility and the desire for rebellion. That's not a pushback against my children, it's a pushback against societal expectations of me as a mother. Mm -hmm. That's really the conversation that I'm yeah. having in my pieces, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks for the question. Yes? When and why you introduce those archetypes when and why? Um, I think that it has a lot to do with like self-identity, right? Like our, our own identity hierarchy. And I, I think we choose, we all have multiple identities, right, that we're dealing with all the time, but for, and then we, we choose to prioritize them, I think. And for me, um, I really wanted to be a mother. It was something that I really wanted as a, as a, as a young person. And so, it became my number one identity. And then when starting this body of work, my youngest son had just moved out. And so it w I was kind of having an identity crisis in a way. And I think that and for new mothers, our society holds a lot of space for new mothers to, creep, to like get used to that new identity and whatever. As old mothers, we don't get that space. Everyone's like, get over it, it's fine. <laughs> It's a whole nother identity shift, and like, how how am I still this mother for these grown people that it's easy to say they don't need me, but they need me in a different way. And so, part of the process of like that piece in particular, like the the deconstruction, re deconstruction and reconstruction, is like like as a mother, you have to change who you are constantly. And I and I finally figured out, oh, this is not anything different. It's just another change. Like, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did I answer your question? <laughs> okay. 
I have a, a comment. It's of course, large. thank you. I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, young people, they go in and young people. Really young people, they see a rotary dial phone, mm -hmm. and they have no idea what it is, and these different things. How many young people didn't know there was cloth diapers? <laughs> so many young and older people, so many people don't know what it is. And so, yeah, my, again, again, going to the abstraction, like, I've been obviously dabbling in, like, art history with this stuff also, like, forcing, it's been sort of a fun, tongue-in-cheek way for me to force motherhood into the conversation of, of the old white guys, right? Like, playing with these modernist things but um yeah i would say it's probably i would say 60 percent of the people don't know what it is until they read but it was important for me to make it cool looking anyway so like i wanted it to be i wanted it, anybody to be able to look at it and kind of appreciate it just for as the object of it, it is hopefully um but then uh, what my favorite thing is when like moms come in and they're like oh like there's a, there's an immediate reaction <laughs> College and a Master of Fine Arts degree in painting from the University of Texas at Austin. Her work has been exhibited throughout the United States, Berlin, and in Texas at Texas State Gallery San Marcos, the McKinney Avenue Contemporary Dallas, Austin Museum of Art Laguna Gloria in Austin, the Wright Gallery at Texas A&M University College Station, UTSA Art Gallery at the University of Texas at San Antonio, Galveston Art Center Galveston, and several other venues. Johnson has held residencies at Joshua Tree Highlands, Joshua Tree, California. How do you say this one in German? Oh, it's such a hard one. How do you say it? Denk mal Schmiede. That's impressive. <laughs> the Vermont Studio Center, Wild Basin Creative Research Center, the Soaring Gardens Artist Retreat, and Try this other one in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> They're both so long. Yes, yeah, so, so she's been in Germany twice, y'all. <laughs> Since 2017, Johnson is an assistant professor in the Department of Art and Art History at Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. We welcome Bethany Johnson. So the, the, the question is about the scale, so the kind of small scale of the works. Um, I think, to back up a little bit, so I started off my practice largely within drawing, um, and I've always been interested in that really intimate scale, um, kind of almost having to do with kind of scientific documentation or kind of the documents or kind of book-like kind of imagery. And so, you know, creating that really intimate kind of one-to-one -one viewer experience with the images was something that was always pretty important to me. Um, and then eventually that kind of uh, turned into a collage practice which a with a lot of the source material that had kind of been assembled um, as kind of my visual archive um, that was kind of building those drawings. And then essentially those kind of turned into 3D, um, which also kind of came along with just alongside my art practice, I had been building a home. Um, so I had a lot of materials. I was thinking a lot about material relationships and thinking about space and you know thinking about three dimensions in this other way. And so it almost felt like everything kind of <laughs> coalesced all together. Um, and speaking of the scale, um, you know, so it it results somewhat from the scale of the source materials. Um, these are all found and waste materials. Um, so, for example, that really kind of like reflective stripe in the closest one is about 20 aluminum cans all stacked up together. And so, you know, it, it's kind of a result of uh, the scale of the sources then kind of stacked and playing down. 
So um, they have grown, um, but I do kind of like their, I, I kind of think of them as kind of specimens or something that might kind of fit on a cabinet of curiosities, you know, kind of thinking of them as being kind of artifacts um, and kind of removed from the world um, for kind of study and, and um, kind of thinking of them as these kind of like well-loved objects. So that's a couple thoughts on the scale. And just to be clear, I'm not making any criticism. Oh, yeah. The I <laughs> having the ability to hold it and touch it, it's, it's great. Yeah. I love it. Oh, I also love the, the height of these pedestals is so lovely for these because again you just you really yeah. need to get close to them. Yeah. I was going to ask uh, were you into geology when you started? Working on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I, I've my work has kind of sparked interest with geologists. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But I do think, yeah, about kind of the scientific specimen, about um, kind of geology and um, kind of the way in which that is transposed into these man-made materials. Um, but just to kind of explain a little bit along with the geology metaphor, um, the way that these are constructed is that they are um, constructed under a great deal of physical pressure. Um, so there isn't any adhesive except at the very top and bottom to kind of cover the hardware. So these, you know, otherwise fairly kind of quiet objects um, actually have a great deal of kind of like embodied energy in them um, because there's a lot of pounds of pressure kind of holding it all together which uh, you know along the lines of kind of geological you know formations and you know kind of deep time and thinking about kind of the accumulation of materials is also something that i'm thinking about for sure cool yes <laughs> question in the back Kim? So, how do you start like, with a smaller one and you keep adding to it? I'll cut up all the materials, stack them together kind of three dimensionally, and then once I have a composition that I'm satisfied with, then I'll apply the hardware, kind of cinch everything together. Um, and in some cases, then too, that's where some of the you know, kind of wave formations and kind of distortions of the layers comes from is the pressure that they're put under by the hardware. And how long before they held in that position before they were stable? Oh, uh, pretty much instantly. Um, yeah. And so there's nothing in between the layers. No, so the, the surface patina is just the material sanded down. Um, so that's something that I'm kind of interested in is how the materials can be both themselves, like they're, they're very much, you know, they, they retain their identity, um, but they also transform. Um, and that's always been something in all of my work, speaking of abstraction, <laughs> that, you know, things can kind of be themselves and be very specific, but then also kind of open themselves up for other interpretations or um, to becoming kind of mysterious also. <laughs> about your title. Yeah. So um, the collage for you all is titled We Live on a Planet 152000 and I noticed with your other collages they also have sort of very similar titles with the numbers and then the sculptures themselves are Untitled Safekeeping. So I was wondering if you could speak to both your titles for the collages and the titles for the sculptures. Yeah, so the We Live on a Planet was the series kind of title for the collages and, um, you know, I think that title in particular kind of speaks to some of the kind of environmentalist kind of uh, concerns and thoughts behind these works as well in terms of the kind of found materials and thinking about kind of our responsibility with those as makers and people. Um, and. It's, it's just kind of a phrase that was in my head yeah. for a while. Oh, some of my work is also, you know, kind of uh, galactic and kind of uh, dealing with space as well. So, you know, thinking about kind of our scale, you know, in the universe as well. Um, as far as safekeeping, actually these ones were uh, developed during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So, um, kind of the thoughts I was thinking about safety, uh, and also thinking about the notion of safekeeping in that kind of archival sense, you know? Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of roughly the idea, kind of like keeping something safe um, in this kind of like small kind of um, 
you know, kind of very intimate format. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Betty has a question. Yeah. Were you talking about doing large pieces or doing speak on that at all? Sure, yeah. I mean, part of the scale has also resulted from, this is a very kind of uh, complicated material process to create these sculptures, and so the scale has changed as my familiarity and like, understanding of the process has changed. Um, so I've been able to uh, kind of expand these in scale as well. Since then, I kind of working kind of textbook size-ish and, and kind of building up from there. Um, so they have kind of a different physical presence. They're very dense and very heavy. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think they do something different at that larger scale, uh, whereas this has kind of that artifact-like kind of cabinet kind of curiosities kind of um, sentiment to the size. Um, but it's, yeah, it's been fun to kind of explore what the materials do at different scales. Yeah. So, you're using paper, aluminum hands, what else? Oh, all sorts of things. Uh, yeah, there's hey, a lot of paper. Most of the whites and kind of creams right, right. that you see is paper. Um, there's particle board. There's chipboard. There, you know, that's the kind of like you know cereal box kind of texture and color. Right, right. Um, some plastic. Yeah, plexiglass, um, foam, um, yoga mats. There's all sorts of little like <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of secrets in there. Yeah. <laughs> What is your hardware? You mentioned the hardware. That's what keeps it compressed mm -hmm. underneath the top piece. Is that a secret? Uh, no, it's not a secret. <laughs> I, I, I like that, you know, if, if no one gets this explanation, that they kind of remain, you know, in that kind of mysterious, you know, they some of those materials are kind of legible and some aren't, but um, I'm happy to kind of like give us all the secrets. But uh, yeah, on the interior is uh, screws and then all thread with um, with washer. bolts on, washer, washers and bolts on the other side, essentially kind of like a double-sided bolt. Um, yeah, and that's what's kind of holding the pressure. So you don't take an 80-ton press. No. <laughs> How much volume is it? It probably loses about a third of the height with the compression. Yeah. With the thin layers, and like you said, 20 aluminum cans, but then like fabric pieces and things like one third of an inch. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, some of these contain like so you're building it like three feet right. to make like, it six yeah. inches. Them. Yeah, if you were to hold them, they're they're heavier than they look. Yeah, I'm not sure how heavy they look. Yeah, but they're yeah. They're you should add the weight to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much for all the wonderful questions. All right, thank you so much. Thank you to the artists again for your wonderful. Um, answers to all of everyone's questions. We're going to leave you now to uh, enjoy the drinks and the food that we have. I hope you have a chance to speak to the artists individually now that you've had a chance to meet them all. And we hope you have a wonderful night. Please enjoy the rest of the reception. Thank you so much.